the night seems darkest, that's when God can show up and show out. And uh, in the message today, we're going to see, you know, something very similar to what was what's going on now. The nation of Israel had been, you know, had been in dark times for 400 years. And then burst on the scene, John and, and Jesus, and, and um, it, it completely began to shake things up. And, and um, so this week, even though I was grieved, I was encouraged that God isn't done. I don't believe he's done. And, and um, I believe you guys would say the same, like, this has awakened us. This has shown us just, you know, how dire the time is and how much we should be pressing in. So I just want to encourage you guys as we begin this morning. We'll start reading in verse 22 of John chapter 3. You're there this morning. Say amen. amen. All right. The Bible says, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea. And there he remained with them and baptized. Now John was also baptizing in Anon near Salem, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom ye have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it be given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this my joy is mine fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. So we pick it up in John. We, uh, we are fresh off the account. Jesus had, of course, the encounter with Nicodemus. And the Bible says that now Jesus has made the journey back to the Galilean region, the, the, the Judean region. And he begins his ministry, his public ministry. He begins to go about and to preach the good news of the coming kingdom of God and and draw, of course, men to come to him. And, and the Bible's very clear that the crowds begin to burst. They begin to grow. And, and, and men and women were repenting and turning to God and, and being baptized. And I want you to understand something. This was a, a major deal. There had been no major move of God for some, quite some time. And, and not only had God sent the, the forerunner, John the Baptist, but now the Messiah, Jesus, had come alongside. And, and there was a short time when their ministries overlapped. Can you imagine the setting in Judea at that time? The two most powerful preachers who ever lived preaching simultaneously. And I imagine uh, as Jesus went about, there were miracles being performed and there were uh, lives being transformed. And it was quite uh, an exciting time to, to be in Israel. Both John and Jesus preached the same message. It was a message of repentance and the coming kingdom of God. And as I thought about that this week, uh, the message that uh, Jesus preached and that John preached is still the message that is most needed today, a message of repentance. Oh, I was thinking about our nation and how far we've come away from our, our Christian values and the foundation on which this nation was made great. And, and I was thinking that what this nation needs instead of celebrity power, Pastors, instead of uh, uh, cute, uh, culturally uh, irrelevant churches, is there need to be churches with pulpits aflame for Jesus preaching repentance in a day when we have strayed. <laughs> Repent. Repent. You see, it's a word that most stray away from. It's it's. It's a word that's not very popular, but is a powerful word uh, to change your mind, to turn away from your wicked ways and turn to uh, be in agreement to God and his truth. And John preached a powerful message. He was not very popular. 
uh, as far as within the religious crowds, uh, but the, the multitudes would come and hear this man who was on fire and he preached this powerful message. And then Jesus comes on the scene and likewise with power, with authority, with the filling of the spirit, Jesus, the Bible is very clear. He was the first man who had the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And I can only imagine as these men preached, as men and women probably weeped uh, over their sin, as they probably realized the, the error of their ways and turned back to God. Oh, the nation was being rattled and it was being rattled by uh, powerful preaching. And I want to just say something as I uh, get into this message this morning. You know, God has chosen the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise and and many will mock what we're doing here right now. Many will say, oh, you guys are, are, are foolish to be gathered around this ancient book and, and having some men stand up and declare it as the authority. But may I say, God has always ordained, he has always blessed the spirit-filled preaching of the word of God. And what we need today in our lives is more preaching. <clears throat> These two preachers both drew large crowds, and this was something that, of course, began to cause controversy not only within those who did not believe, but with those who were John's disciples. The Bible says in verse 23, we'll start reading, and Jesus was baptizing, and John was baptizing, and and John had not yet been thrown into prison in verse 24. And I want you to see that right away. This is, it's, it's important to note that soon after this, John would be cast into prison. Why? For speaking truth. You guys heard about that pastor up in Canada who stood, who took a bold stance and, and preached the truth and did not close his doors. And of course, he was in prison. He was in in solitary confinement for the last three weeks, and he was just finally released this week. And, and it was, of course, a indication. And we think, oh, that's up in Canada. Let me tell you, that's coming here next. You know, we've been asleep in a slumber of the church so long that uh, the needle's been being moved for quite some time. And it's not until they come knocking on our door that many are going to wake up. You see, whenever a man or a woman takes a bold stance for truth, it will get them in hot water. As I mentioned many times already in this series, that being a true Christian has never been safe. It's never been comfortable. It's never been a part of the in crowd. And this was the case with John. He was preaching the truth, and it ended up getting him thrown into prison by Herod, the, the king uh, uh, appointed by Rome in that region. You see, he had took it even further. He had spoken truth to Herod. He had, you see, God has always had men who were bold to speak the truth, even to those who were outside of the body. Oh, oh, we think today that we as a church, we should just be silent when it comes to matter of sin and wickedness and debauchery. But no, God has always had men and women who stood up and spoke the truth when lies are being promoted. And this was what got John in prison. He told Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife, Herodias. He said, you, 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 you're not supposed to do that. Oh, we've seen, we've seen men who have taken a stance against the government in this age. I think about John MacArthur down the way. I think about Rob McCoy and others who have took a stand and how they have gotten in hot water because of it. This is always true. And quite frequently... Persecution comes from political leaders. And I read a quote from one of my friends from the, the Baptist circles, and he was saying this week, uh, as he tweeted this, that, that we as preachers should not mention politics, that we should just stick to what we're supposed to stick to. And don't get me wrong, the priority is the gospel. But more and more so, I see the need for men to be bold and to stand up and speak the truth as regarding to those in leadership. And this is what got John in prison. Ultimately, he would have his head cut off because of this. 
Now, Herod was not a believer. We know he was not a, pol- he was a political leader, a king. He was, he was a man who, uh, was, was not led of the, of the spirit. And let me tell you this, when, when he heard about Jesus, when Herod heard about Jesus coming on the scene, he thought that John the Baptist had resurrected from the dead. You see, uh, his ministry was, uh, powerful as was John. And, and so he was sure that somehow God had raised up this man. He knew that Her- he knew that John was God's man. And what we need today is for us to be so distinct, so bold, so, uh, filled with the spirit that people cannot deny the fact that we belong to God. Can that be said of us? Oh, we are to be the ecclesia, the called out body of believers, the, the assembly. We ought to be impacting the world, but it seems to me today that the world is impacting and affecting the church, infecting the church, may I say. And every time that the nation of Israel got away from God, God had a men, he had, he sent men and, and women into that nation to speak boldly against the direction the nation was going. You see, if there was an Ahab, God always had an Elijah. If there was a Goliath and the Philistines mocking God, God always had a David. If there was a Nebuchadnezzar telling them to bow down, oh, God always had a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And what I've been trying to do over the last several weeks is, is to preach the truth to us and, and wake us up because such a time as this, God has decided to let us be on earth. And what we need to be doing is shining bright for the kingdom of God. That will get us thrown in the fire. But there's another in the fire. <laughs> I was thinking about that this week. How we've got to be willing to burn. And you know, when we're already on fire, it's not so scary. <laughs> but the truth is, Church has been lukewarm for too long. You see, Jesus rejects lukewarm Christianity. The world accepts them. The world persecutes on fire bold Christians, but Jesus commends them. Read the book of Revelation. Now, I'm I'm speaking to the church today. We expect that God will move and We anticipate for God to change our circumstances, but what I believe God is trying to do in these circumstances is change us. He's putting us in the fire to refine us, to wake us up. And and I think that the constant mockery and attacks against Christianity in our day is confirmation of two things. Number one, that of course what we believe is truth. The constant, uh, the constant attacks on Jesus is confirmation of the Antichrist spirit in the world and that he is who he says he is in the world is, is led by the system the, the, that's set up by the devil. And, and he's, he's, he's very careful to uh, mock uh, Jesus and try to, uh, try to uh, play down what is the truth and I think is also an indication of the powerlessness of the American church. See, they're not, they don't fear God. They don't fear God because they, they don't see him, they don't see us fearing him. They don't, see, they don't see the church as a powerful agent of change in the nation. John Knox was a powerful prayer warrior in his day. One of his largest opponents or oppositions to his ministry was Queen Mary of the Scots and she, it was, she said this about John Knox. She says, I fear John Knox's prayer more than all the assembled armies of Europe. John Knox's prayers, uh, I fear more than all the assembled armies of Europe. John Knox was famous for praying in this prayer to the Lord. He said, give me Scotland, Lord, else I die. 
problem is today, there are few men and women who are willing to burn for God, who are willing to pay the price for God, who are willing to say, Lord, give me America, else I die. And so hence we are powerless. Even Herod feared, he said, oh, John is back from the dead because he had a powerful ministry. And what I'm saying to you guys today, what God has been just impressing upon us in this season is that we've got to stop playing around with God. We've got to become true disciples. We've got to press in. We've got to really live out our faith. We've got to be willing to, to be bold for God and, 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 and allow his spirit to fill us. The problem is in most churches today, most uh, churches today lack people who are truly uh, filled with the spirit of God. I was reading a book this week about the men and women who changed the world and the common thread between these men and women were that they had an encounter with God where they were subsequently filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And then there was boldness that came. Then there was power behind their ministry and their, their messages. My friends, what we need to be praying for, uh, we need to be seeking is the filling of the Holy Spirit in this day because without the Holy Spirit, we're doomed. You see, Either America will repent or America will cease to be. I'm telling you. And if you don't see that clearly in the, written in the sand, then I don't know what's going to wake you up. If the last year in this country has not awakened you, why is it okay to sell shoes that have pentagrams and human blood in it and promote Satan on social media. And, and, he, and that young man came out with a video. Uh, I won't even describe what was going on in the video, but it was trending. It was number one on YouTube. But messages like this one and others are, are being shadow banned and, and being taken down. And anyone who would speak against anything that we see that we know to be ungodly, they're being censored. And can't you see the clear agenda, y'all? Can't you see where we are heading? Persecution is here. And often it comes from leadership, government. And this was the case in John's life. He is not yet in prison, but he soon would be for speaking truth. John of course, had those who were his disciples who had, who had followed him and began to be discipled by John. And there arose between John's disciples and some of the Jews a, a dispute, an argument. And I've learned this, you know, when, when you're not busy working in the kingdom and, and serving the kingdom, you will often find yourselves in these meaningless debates who has time for that today when the world is lost? But this is what was taking place here. They were disputing with the Jews. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe in apologetics. I believe that we should be in those arenas where we defend our truth and of the truth of the word of God. Don't get me wrong. I think every Christian should know what they believe and be able to articulate and defend it. But don't get me wrong. Uh, I don't spend a lot of times arguing on social media you won't see me going into the comments debating people. You won't see me doing that. And the reason being, not because I don't want to sometimes, and not because I cannot hold my own in, in, by God's grace, but because I've learned that it's, it's, it's a lot of times it's frivolous. It, it is not a good use of my time. So John's disciples are in an argument with some of the Jews, and it's concerning purification. Now, this is a major uh, doctrine to the Jews. They, they were very big on purification. They felt that if they were not pure ceremonially, that they would not be able to please God. And of course, 
Um, Jesus would later debunk all the, the religiosity of that because he said they would clean the outside of the, of the vessel, but the inside would be dead. And he would, he would get down to the matters of the heart because Jesus is always concerned with the purity of our hearts and, and our love for him. And so John's disciples are going back and forth and, and obviously they got, they got, uh, twisted in this argument because they had to run back to John. You see that one of the people disputing with John's disciples obviously pointed out the fact that John's crowds were rapidly declining while Jesus' crowds were exploding. Both baptized, both preached repentance, and I believe the question that was posed by the Jews were, who should we follow, this Jesus or John the Baptist? Now, the answer is very clear. John had made it very clear, and we'll see in just a moment that it was, it was to follow Jesus. And they came to John and said, the one who you, you testified of, he, he's, he's baptizing and all men come to him. And they were saying it in a sort of resentment type of way. They were saying it lamenting and not rejoicing that all men were starting to go to Jesus. You see, pride had crept into their hearts. Maybe they were one of the first to follow John and they, they, they started to enjoy the crowds that were coming and the, the prominence of being near God's man. And I don't know what caused the pride to creep in, but it was evident. And there are two clear signs that these men, these disciples who came to John were dealing with this. And it was the fact that they were in competition with Jesus. They were trying to pit John against Jesus, and, and they were all about competition. And, and this is something that if you've ever been in ministry, if you've ever pastored, you are aware of it. Uh, when I was, you know, pastoring before, uh, every Sunday I would stay off of social media. You know, I was planting a church in the inner city. It was not an easy word. And, uh, you know, everybody's social media, every pastor's social media is just this highlight reel, Right. And every they'd get on there and say, we had, you know, 500 people there on Sunday, you know, and this many saved, you know, and they'd get on there and they'd throw these stats up, you know. And, and if I wasn't careful, I'd be depressed because we had 40 people, you know. And, and um, often I had, to, I had to come to the point where I just would not be on social media. And then ultimately God showed me that there was, there was pride in my heart. Why can't I be happy if God is blessing someone else's ministry? And may I say this, this is what John was going to say to these men. A man can receive nothing except to be given him from God. And any ministry blessing, any, any ministry growth, any uh, obvious uh, 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 you know, enabling or, or growth by the Lord, uh, it comes from, of course, above. It comes from God. And so these men had gotten into, caught in the trap of competition in the, and also in the trap of comparison. One of the things I hate about social media is it causes us to compare Compare their relationship, compare their, and being a pastor, let me tell you guys, what people put on social media is not true. I've counseled a lot of those people. <laughs> We've lived, we live in a day of, of, of comparison. The Bible says it is not wise. It is never wise to compare yourself. You don't know the circumstances. You don't know the truth. And John is speaking to these men as they come to him, and, and his reply is very simple. He says, a man can receive nothing unless it be given him from heaven. See, John understood, John understood who he was. He understood who Jesus was. He understood that he was sent to prepare the way for Jesus, and he understood that Jesus was the way. He understood that he was to be a witness of the light, and that Jesus was the true light. Oh, John may have baptized with water, but he knew that Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit and power. John knew he was given a ministry that would one day decrease, but Jesus was given a ministry that will perpetually increase. In this very moment, the gospel is being preached around the world, and Jesus' ministry is still increasing. John understood that he was not the Christ, but that he was the bride, 
the bride's best man, bridegroom's best man. And the picture that he used is that of a best man and the bridegroom. I remember the first wedding I ever attended, I was the best man in it. It was my, my good friend Rob and his, his wife, Stephanie. I remember I flew to uh, Kentucky, and it was during July. Oh, my goodness, it was the first time I had <laughs> experienced humidity like that. How many of you guys are from that, that part of the, uh, the country, and you know what that humidity feels like? I just remember just, you know, just get into that wedding and, you know, got there at night. And, and when we got to the neighborhood where we would stay, I stayed at, at the pastor of the church's home. And, you know, they were flying there. He had a decent sized property and, and he took me out in the back and, you know, just in his backyard, there's just trees, you know, just beautiful trees, green, the greenest place I've ever really been. And so, you know, you see the fireflies and I mean, just beautiful country. He took me to to Cracker Barrel, and, and <laughs> it was a great time. Anybody know about Cracker Barrel? Okay, amen. See, these are things you won't get when pastor preaches, okay? He don't go to, he don't go to Cracker Barrel. <laughs> but anyways, so, man, it was quite an experience, you know, in the south there. But I remember the day of the wedding and, and just being there with my friend and just seeing his joy, his, you know, just... Being a part of that day, it was, it was quite an experience. And, and, of course, I was given the duty of, of the best man to make sure everything was going well. I, I was given the ring, you know, to hold on to. I was, I was sent in to show a video to his, his soon-to-be bride. And, and I was uh, just a part of that day. And, and it was, I couldn't stop smiling. I enjoyed the wedding. And I had a blast. And I'll never forget it. And what John was illustrating to these men was that Christ was the bridegroom, and he is now coming for his bride. And it was not for him to get in, in the mix of that. It was not about him any longer. It was, he was just the forerunner, and he was to step aside. He was to bow down and defer to Jesus, and, and he rejoiced in this. He rejoiced. He says, my joy is fulfilled that all men are going to this Christ. And let me tell you this, any man of God or any woman of God who truly are in tune with God, uh, they always want this to be the case where people say, stop following them and start following Jesus. Oh, I remember the day of my life when I stopped following the example of my mother and others who influenced me. And when I, by myself, began to seek God and have that relationship with him, and it was a joyous time in my life. And I know for my uh, influencers, it was joyous for them. And this is what John is saying. He's saying, hey, he's the bridegroom. <laughs> he's the Christ. He's the light. He's the way. Guys, there's no competition here. There's no comparison. We, we are on the same team. And, and I'm afraid that a lot of the division in Christianity today, even in some of this denominational stuff and in, in America, is because pride has crept in. And the devil has done a great job of dividing the church to, to, to limiting our influence because of pride. And I remember being a part, uh, being that way and not wanting to. I would have never stepped my foot in a church like this a few years ago. Because I was told that we had the one truth. We had the right way. We, they're doing it wrong, but we got it right. So we, we're, we're separatists. We, we will never intermingle with these types of, of Christians. And oh, how foolish are we? The only thing that should divide us is if there is heretical teaching, if there is true uh, her heresy taking place and, and the, the non-essentials and how we, we are, our pet peeves and our preferential stuff should never divide the church, but that's what we see taking place in America today. And John, he was not about that life. He was about Jesus receiving what's due him. He was about the kingdom. And he says it this way. He says, he must increase, but I must decrease. This is the third of three musts found in John 3. You see, the first must was to the sinner. When Jesus said to Nicodemus that he must be born again. 
The second was to was of the Savior when Jesus said that he must be lifted up, when he must die on the cross. And here's the third, and it is that of a servant. A servant must decrease so that our Savior can increase. And I'm afraid that many of us our learning and our awareness of God and our familiarity with Scripture and, and other, you know, maybe ministry, even ministry blessing has caused us to increase in our own eyes, therefore hindering God increasing. Oh, I think how many people get in the way of others coming to Christ because they're filled with pride, they're filled with themselves. I was on the phone with a family member. We had, we had a recent family member uh, here in town actually pass away unexpectedly. And I was on the phone with uh, uh, her brother, my cousin. And, and I had gone out to visit a few years back. Uh, that he lives in Texas. And, and I went to visit uh, some family that was there. And, and, and he was one that I, I spent some time with. And as we got on the phone and we're talking about the arrangements uh, of the upcoming uh, celebration of life for my cousin. Uh, he said, you know what, before we get going, I just, I just have to get something off my chest. And, and he and I, we hadn't talked in about, about five years. And he said, you're probably wondering why we haven't talked. And, and I want you to know that when you were out here last time that you, you, you hurt me. You, 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 you look down on me. You were very critical of some things in my life that, you know, God was, you know, obviously working on me about, and and it just it just didn't sit well with me. And immediately my heart sank into my gut because I knew He was telling the truth. A few years ago, I wouldn't go to any family events that had alcohol. I wouldn't. I wouldn't if they started playing any. Music other than Christian music, I would leave, I would, I would isolate myself, and I would do so in a manner that was holier than thou. I was filled with pride. And I had to apologize to him, and I couldn't help but think in my heart, like how many others, because of my pride, didn't want anything to do with that type of, with that brand of Christianity. And I'm speaking to you guys today because that's what we see all, all throughout Christendom today. All you have to do is go on social media and you'll see people in this room who the pride is just so evident. And it's abrasive to the world. And it's It's hurting the kingdom. But I want you to understand that if we are going to see God's kingdom grow, if we are going to be used by him in a greater measure, we must decrease. We have to. I'm so thankful God broke that pride. And you know what it took? It took failure. Some of the same people who are so pride-filled if you were to take a, a closer look at their lives, their marriage is falling apart. They have no grace for anybody. They, they have no fruit of the Spirit in their lives. And for me, it took failure. It took absolute falling, falling on my face and then getting to the point where I cried out to God. You see, there needs to be repentance in the church today. Repentance, I'm not just talking to those who are outside of these walls. You see, we need to repent of our pride, our arrogance, our prayerlessness, so I can keep going. He must increase. I must decrease. D.L. Moody said, God sends no one away empty except those full of themselves. So true. 
So the dispute was, <laughs> was quickly shot down by John. He understood. And then there's, a, there's some debate within theologians and of who spoke next, if it was John the Baptist or John the, uh, the Apostle. But then he, there is, uh, there's a witness here. It's Jesus' witness is given in the next few verses. And the Bible is very clear about a few things. I'll just break it down. I won't take a lot of time here because I could honestly preach another message on this. But the witness found in verse 31 is the fact that Jesus came from heaven. You see, John said, he that cometh from above is above all. See, why should he increase? <laughs> why should we listen to his testimony, his witness? Because he came from heaven. It's speaking of his divinity, the fact that he existed prior in heaven. He was eternal God, and by him all things that we see were created. And, and so John is saying, hey, you should listen to the testimony that I gave and that he himself gives, that he is from heaven. And he told the same thing to Nicodemus, hey, you you need to listen to what I have to say because I am sent down from heaven. I have come from heaven. And his testimony, because of that, was firsthand. Verses 32 through 33. He says, And he hath seen and heard that he testified. He said, Everything that Jesus is testifying, he with his own eyes has seen and he's heard. Jesus. He had all the answers because he, he was the truth. And Jesus knew the way to eternal life because he himself was the way. Jesus was the source of all life he, he, because he himself is life. You see, he, he was uh, giving firsthand testimony because he is eternal God. And then thirdly, the Father had confirmed him and still does. See, God had given Jesus the words to speak. God had given Jesus the fullness of the Holy Spirit. God had given him everything into his hand. And, and Jesus had a fellowship with the Father. He was in tune with him as being a part of the Trinity. And the Father confirmed it. Oh, when he was baptized from heaven, the skies opened and, and the dove, the picture of the Holy Spirit came down and rested upon him. And the audible voice of God was heard from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The Father has confirmed him. And because of his testimony, because of who he is, he has the truth in how we might escape the wrath to come. Once you see verse 36, he said, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. This is the only place in the book of John that you see that word wrath. You see, the truth is those who reject Jesus and his testimony, the wrath of God abides on them. It's already over. It, it does not take for them to die and to go to a crisis hell for the wrath of God to already be on them. You see, this is why we must preach the message of repentance. Because every person that you see without Christ, the wrath of God is over. It's kind of like they're walking around with the wrath of God hanging over them. And they don't realize it because they never even look up. And I can't help but think about this young man, you know, with the shoes and with the video. How he has no idea what he's playing with. Eternity separated from God in a, in a place of torment. It's nothing to play with, and I wouldn't wish hell on, on my worst enemy. I wouldn't wish hell on my worst enemy. And the Bible is clear that the wrath of God will one day come for those who reject. You see, there's no in-between, folks. It's either acceptance or rejectance. 
See, John wrote later, he said, he that hath the Son hath life, but he that hath not the Son hath not life. Oh, the, the, the seriousness of that. The seriousness of that. I heard one of my instructors in college, he uh, was also a traveling evangelist, and he spoke about one time in particular where he was called to visit a man who was close to death. And one of his family members requested that he visit him and share the gospel with him one last time. And there, the, my instructor went and he goes to share the gospel with this man and who's been not only a rejecter of, of Jesus, but a, a, an antagonistic rejecter of Jesus. And he gets there to the house and he, he told us about how he got there and that the man was like most who were in their last hours. He, was, he had lost a lot of weight and he was, couldn't stay warm. And, and uh, he gets there and he, he introduces himself and he opens the Bible and the man says, get that away from me. I don't want to hear anything you have to say. And, and uh, he's still in his, on his deathbed rejecting. And my instructor tried his best to try to talk to him, but the man would have no part of it. Later on, my instructor would go back to that church and he would ask that family member who had sent him over, hey, uh, whatever, did anything ever happen with your, your loved one? And they were like, oh, no. Finally, they had to take him to the hospital. And, and um, while he was there at the hospital, he still rejected Jesus. We tried. And, and they began to tell him about how, as he was in his last minutes, he began to be delusional. They believed, but he, he began to, this man who was dying began to say, my feet, my feet. Get them out the fire. My feet, my feet. Get them away from the fire. And he kept repeating this over and over again. I couldn't help but think as his life was ending here, he's going into eternity, he was seeing his fate. the wrath of God. I want us to understand something. That every person without Christ is under the wrath of God. And we should be praying and seeking and, and, and sharing the good news and preaching for repentance. You see, John the Baptist would have a short ministry, but it was an effective ministry. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't want to get to heaven and, and having, you know, just squandered away my life. I want to be faithful. And this is, I believe, the theme throughout the New Testament is these testimonies are given to us so that we can frame our entire lives around the truth. That's it, y'all. And uh, it is my prayer that we be a church that is on mission.